I will, uh, I will present today really maybe 10 years of, of research uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in a part of a country where really immigration has been, I mean, less common. Uh, Atlantic Canada has been changing with uh, some immigration, but also it's still very challenging for the region when we think of immigration in, in region of, of, of a homogeneous population of small and, and small cities, rural regions. Uh, Atlantic Canada is still a, a challenge when we think of immigration. So I, I put research findings and observation, and you'll see why when I when we go through the presentation. So first I'd like to maybe talk about the approach I have when I, when I do research on immigration or the way I, I did research on, Im on immigration in the last uh, 10 years. I'll talk about the Atlantic context and then I will present three cases of research on uh, migrants in the, in, the, in the region. We have, I did some work on Korean migrants a few years ago. I think it was interesting because it it showed maybe the way uh, a province tries to attract immigrants. Then uh, I will talk about international students, which is a, I would say, a hot topic now. And finally, a new emerging research on temporary foreign workers also in the region. So you'll have these uh, three cases maybe to illustrate what I, what I see in the region. Uh, my approach is very interdisciplinary. I, 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 I'm, I'm from poly science, but I have a way maybe of looking at migration or immigration that is looking at migration studies, public policy, sociology, but also I would say uh, I've been interested in literature, uh, film studies. Uh, for me, immigration can be seen from different perspectives, and I, when I when I do research, I, I'm, I'm very interested also in, in maybe trying to really, uh, and I try to translate this, but in French we say la condition du migrant, uh, which is uh, f the way the migrant feels uh, when he, he moves, or the mobility of the migrant, the integration process, the, the relation of the migrant with the community, with the welcoming community, and I, I put a few names here, maybe you're not familiar with all the, these authors, Bridget Anderson, yes, maybe when she talks about precarious workers and the way uh, workers uh, in our global age are in situation of temporariness or uh, precarity. But this uh, Algerian scholar, sociologist, Adel Malak Sayad, very interesting, I don't think he's, he's been translated in English, I think, but Sayad really I, f I find is probably in the French language, in the French literature on immigration is probably someone you, you should read. If, uh, but uh, he really is very, I think his writing is very interesting when we think of the perspective of the immigrant uh, and his journey. I also did some film, uh, I did two film with uh, the NFB and the last one, I mean it dates a bit, but still it's really interesting because I, I, I learned a lot about the experience or the approach of film uh, by filming immigrants, filming uh, international students, and that really also uh, helped me a lot in, in understanding uh, what do these uh, students feel and when you put them on camera I think it's uh, the interview uh, the filming interview and long interview with uh, students was it was very interesting so this film uh, is on you can see it on the web it's uh, it's uh, an, an NFB film finally I did recently an essay an essay uh, <coughs> so I would say these two books are important but this book here, I'm very proud of it because I said it's a, an essay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not thinking of numbers in my... I, I want to write an essay and this is one result of, of a sabbatical. It helps when you can go <laughs> far away and I went back to my home country, Tunisia, and uh, I wrote this essay th thinking, well, I want to write on uh, this notion of here and somewhere else and immigrants leaving one place, going to another place. It's my story, it's my family's story, it's maybe your story, some of your story, but it's, it's a story that can be written in different ways. 
And I think the essay really was also a great experience because it was a way of, of writing differently than this, for example, which is really what I do most of my research is on small regionalization or immigration outside large centers. And this is a, a book that came out uh, a year ago also on uh, immigration uh, in five federal countries, so policies, strategies uh, of uh, regionalization of immigration. If you have any questions, don't you can we can engage. Uh, I don't we don't need to wait to the end. But when I think of Atlantic Canada, uh, also <coughs> that's maybe my background in political science. But I like I think we need to be global. We need to understand immigration in a global perspective. And I mean, this is things that could be said in in, in any context. When we think of immigration now. I think I, I frame my research in these four, these four uh, elements where we know there's growing mobility uh, across uh, the planet. We know that immigration also now, uh, when we think of immigration in, in a federal context, we have new uh, stakeholders, new actors, uh, sharing powers, uh, provinces, municipalities, civil society. So there's, there's been a lot of writing on this. I think also when we look, so I think of Atlantic Canada being uh, subject to these uh, large global uh, dynamics and in the region also I think it's interesting immigration and diversity we know there's a diversification of diversity I don't know if we can say it that way but in diversification de la diversité I think when we think of Atlantic Canada it used to be British uh, American uh, Europeans migrants but you know the region has been changing with new uh, countries of immigrants coming to uh, the region so for example Asian immigrants uh, Middle Eastern something we see uh, everywhere but the region also this region Nova Scotia New Brunswick uh, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island have have seen this also and also I think when we when we see migrants going into new destinations there's an issue also of of settlement and integration so uh, traditionally in the region in Atlantic Canada it would be mostly refugees so services that would be framed to, to, to serve refugees but with new categories of migrants we see also uh, the whole issue of settlement changing and the welcoming community so there's been a, also in Canada a very interesting work on the notion of of the welcoming community and that in, in, the, in the Atlantic context I think it plays a lot also smaller cities, rural region, the whole issue of welcoming has been uh, something that's been more discussed. We know in the, in the region also there's an, I mean these are just facts but uh, it's uh, something that came out and we know uh, aging population, low fertility, Interprovincial migration, young young Atlanticers going out west, uh, leaving the region. I mean, I think it's everywhere. It's not only. It's probably rural Ontario or uh, people going to Alberta. To the 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 mobility of youth in Canada, the fly in, fly out. Uh, uh, three weeks in Alberta and two weeks. Uh, in Moncton, uh, we see that a lot from, from my perspective, traveling to the east, you see it a lot. So there's a context that is, uh, and, and, uh, and with this, we have low immigration compared to the rest of the country. So it's a, it's a, it's a setting that's been, that is, like I said, challenging. But still, we have some uh, reality in the labor market that needs to be put forward when we uh, when the region wants to attract immigration there is uh, work to be done with uh, the capacity of the economy or the, the the willingness also of smaller businesses of of smaller companies of employers in the region to to really uh, adapt to uh, maybe uh, hiring uh, new Canadians hiring immigrants. So there's also in the region some mismatch when we look at the, w the distribution of, of, uh, of, the, of the economy, there's a few uh, important mismatch, especially between rural and urban regions. So these are 
a few things I wanted to say to, to beginning. We know, I mean, this is, I mean, I could skip this, but uh, what is happening in Canada when we think of our immigration is a shift towards uh, temporary, temporary immigration. And in the Atlantic region, we see the same, the same pattern. Uh, I, I made it a bit more complicated because I, I, dis I made a distinction between urban and rural region. But in the Atlantic region, what we see is a rise <coughs> is a rise of temporary immigration, and especially in rural region, uh, especially in rural region. And this, and we see a decline of permanent residents. So we we tend to see a, a decline of of the the classic model. Uh, and you could compare each province, and I did this across the country, and you see some variation, it's interesting variation between the provinces when we look at the, the categories of migrants. I think the Quebec one would be the more classic model. It still s s looks like a national building model where you have permanent residence, economic immigration, less temporary. You go to Alberta, it's a, it's a mess. It, it goes and you see the the fluctuation. But in the Atlantic also, you see temporary workers going up, you see a decline of permanent residents. Foreign students, it's, it's still, it's, it's, it went up, but uh, really what we see is, and maybe this one shows you also, if I look only at temporary workers, you see, a, you see some provinces, for example, Newfoundland, with a high rise of, of with a, a growth of temporary workers in the last year, but also other provinces uh, having a, a higher number of temporary workers. Okay, so let me switch to ma maybe some research uh, I did with colleagues because I think I if if I like interdisciplinarity, I'm bound we say to work with other colleagues. I, I think that's something I, I appreciate a lot. I worked with Anne Kim on this project on Korean immigrants in New Brunswick. It, it, it started with uh, the province wanting to know more about something that was happening in New Brunswick, Korean immigrants. And so they, they said we, want, we, we need to know what, what really is happening. And myself, knowing my province, but not really that population, I joined with Anne and we did some interesting work on uh, the Korean uh, immigrants in New Brunswick. So we, uh, we know that this population is, uh, is growing rapidly across the country. It was also, there was some projection in Atlantic Canada that it was growing. Uh, there was also Changes in, there was a push, uh, we could say people wanting to, to move out, to leave Cor South Korea. Uh, uh, there, I mean, and we were also, she we were familiar with uh, mobilities, transnational families, economic immigration. There's factors of mobility that showed that South Koreans were uh, moving. I mean, mob the mobility to Canada is, is, is something that is, it's not new. But why Atlantic Canada? That, that was new. That was really new. At the time, we realized in a few years, it really, the growth of the, the, the Koreans in, the South Koreans in, in New Brunswick, and the research was only on New Brunswick, it was visible in a, few, in a span of three, four years that it really, it picked up. It picked up in three cities. And that came, I mean, we came, we were very interested by this, so we, we, we did some focus group with uh, the Korean, uh, with uh, some, some immigrants, and we also did some interviews with a, a group of stakeholders, cities, municipalities, and we looked at uh, the issue of maybe why move to New Brunswick, and there's reason to move to New Brunswick. We, we, we saw that there were a few of, of these reasons that came up, but two that came really a lot, I mean, this one came a lot, uh, it was the education factor. It was not, there's uh, economic opportunities to New Brunswick, so we're moving to New Brunswick. Uh, it was more, we think that New Brunswick is offering something that we can, we could, we see it as maybe something that we, we don't have uh, in our country. So quality, not quality of education, but uh, 
maybe the fact that the system of education uh, in Canada is, is very different from, from South Korea. Uh, the fact that uh, these families thought that the future of their children is very important and they were, they were attracted maybe by the way the province of New Brunswick actually did also uh, the pitch, uh, the sales pitch, the way the province. So that played also a lot in the way one province was, was able to go to South Korea and to to, to, to sell the province, uh, to sell the education, to sell the quality of life. So this study showed us really how one province, uh, now getting more uh, concern about demographic reason, maybe being very uh, wanting to attract migrants, wanting to attract economic migrants, and going, you know, doing some recruitment. And, and so the way the province or even the, the cities uh, did the recruitment in Korea is interesting by, by showing how, what, how did they sell the province. Uh, not saying come to Atlantic Canada, we have great salaries, uh, the economy's booming. Uh, it's warm. <laughs> it's warm, no, it's, it, was, it was playing on, on, on education a lot. And that really, it struck, it was surprise, for me it was a surprise. Uh, also we looked at the, act, the, the local actors and I thought that was interesting also. There was a match, there was like a, a perfect match. People and, and, and maybe, they were talking uh, of the Korean immigration as a success story. Uh, they were, uh, like I said, the, la the actors were saying, well, we played on this. We played on education and good quality of life in New Brunswick. We, we also played in, in, on the fact that maybe a, a small province is, a, is an added value instead of, of, of uh, and some said, you know, most kids are white in New Brunswick and Korean will prefer that instead of being in a class where you have maybe 50% of the class from the same country of origin. They said, well, in Korea, uh, in New Brunswick, we will, it's not like Ontario or Vancouver, it's, uh, it's a completely different setting. And when we talked also to stakeholders, that came out, uh, that came out also, and it was uh, sometimes a bit, as a, you know, we were like, okay, uh, but uh, we, we could hear, you know, it's a good suit for the community. Koreans were seen as, you know, the ideal immigrant for Atlantic, for, for New Brunswick at the time. They're, they're investing a lot of money to the, their uh, entrepreneurs, they're buying businesses, uh, so there's an economic factor. It's a good suit for, for the community. We heard Arguments such as these, it's not a community, but more individuals trying to succeed. So they blend, you know, they fit in. Uh, the religion and values are closer to us. So we heard that also from some of the, of the people in Moncton, I remember this. So it made me thinking, it made me think to a, 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 a the writing of a sociologist uh, who was actually in New Brunswick, uh, who wrote a book called The Silent Ethnicity uh, back in the 50s or the 60s, I think, where he, it, it was a study, a very interesting study on Dutch immigrants uh, coming to, to New Brunswick. And, and uh, this whole notion of immigrants coming in a, in, a, in, a, in a province or in a community and not just trying to to blend in uh, led to this notion maybe of silent ethnicity where they don't uh, they don't ask for too much I don't know if I'm saying it right but in the interview also that came out where they were saying well there's other sort of other group of immigrants who ask too much who are more uh, militant who are always asking asking for services uh, demanding services compared to maybe other immigrants who are just uh, coming in slowly, but uh, not asking too much. Okay. 
and uh, that came up here. Other immigrants are much more vocal. French, for example, francophone immigrants. <laughs> they were saying, oh, they, they, they're not happy. Or North African, African immigrants, they're not happy. They want services. It's, but it's a completely different, you could say, well, they're not at this, it's a different, uh, there's a lot of differences also probably socio, socio de, you know, demography characteristics, economic characteristics, that plays a lot too. But so this, it's the impression that maybe that Korean immigrants were the perfect match for the province and that played a lot in, in explaining why uh, a lot of people saw it as a, maybe a success story. But the research really came to, 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 to look, we, we, we thought it was interesting to look at it from recruitment strategies, how a province recruits. There were also some important uh, policies uh, component to it. The PNP, the Provincial Nominee Program, that played a huge part in attracting uh, Koreans. Uh, uh, we saw that there would be some, uh, after we said, well, if, it, if, it, if this will work on the long term, the, there's, need, there's a, a need also to look at um, thinking in the long term. So in New Brunswick, there's a way maybe of celebrating differences in a very uh, multicultural model where we, we only think of celebration of differences. Uh, we need to go beyond the maybe thinking only that Koreans will buy businesses and be their own entrepreneur. So the whole issue of, of uh, integration, it's easy. Uh, there's a limit to, to that. I mean, you c and, and the Koreans also expressed this in, in the focus group saying, well, we're not only here to buy businesses that nobody wants. And after a while, there's no, how many Korean restaurant you can have in Moncton, uh, it's not going to work. It's, uh, but we see mobility also. We saw that Koreans finally were even going to maybe even smaller uh, cities to try to get a business. So this, uh, for them, it, it, it was, it's a very, it was a, a stressful uh, situation because they had, after a year, I think, had to, to they can't just stay and, and wait for the opportunity. They need to find the opportunity. We saw also that uh, <clears throat> education, like I said, is a, is a very important factor. So the kids, uh, young kids in school in New Brunswick was seen as okay, but when they uh, jumped to the, to the next step, university, uh, some of these parents were saying, we'll probably move because uh, the perception was that there was no uh, good or good opportunities uh, when we think of education, post-second degree education, it was, it, was, it was time to move. So that's uh, one research we did we, that I think that really il illustrates pretty well also uh, one reality of the region. International students, I don't know how much time. Uh, lots of time? Okay. Uh, international students, that's something that I, uh, I started doing a few years ago. Uh, but not really looking at the international students themselves, but the role of universities, so the actor, the, ro the university, and how the university plays a new role in immigration. Uh, universities for a long time, well, we had uh, diversity and universities have been uh, interested in, in, in recruiting international students, but in recent years it, it took more uh, it took a lot more place in the way universities see sees uh, international students. So really to understand the role of, of the university and also to understand the role of each actor working with universities. So if universities, how do they interact with other type of actors in, in, the, munis in the environment with which, which is the community, which the municipality, the employers, things like this. Uh, we, we've worked through uh, mostly uh, interviews and also some participant observation. I'll give you just a few highlights maybe of this because it's been, a <laughs> it's an ongoing research I would say. I, I, it never stops. But really when I started doing this I looked at 
First I looked at universities in Atlantic Canada. I looked at eight universities in Atlantic Canada and my shirt grant a few years ago, I, I had a shirt grant and it was mostly, I decided to look at small francophone universities in four provinces. So I looked at one in Ontario, Laurentian, Saint Boniface in Winnipeg, Sherbrooke uh, in Quebec, and Moncton. So, and I, and the, the whole research was, it was pretty straightforward. We, I was interested in looking at how do university attract, how do we integrate foreign students, and how do we retain. So this part here, I mean it's university but also other, other actors. So that, and it, it that was really the way I, I, I looked at this. And we came with uh, interesting uh, results also, I think, on the policy front especially, the way we can... Uh, so, we know there's greater student mobility for a lot of reason. There's economic reason. Uh, we know that universities also recruit. They, they have put in place uh, a lot of, of of tools to recruit uh, on the international front. There's also a shift in public policies when we think of international students in Canada there's been uh, a lot of changes uh, and we see international students like I said as ideal immigrants and the whole issue now is maybe here. I mean I think that when we look at international students it's if we think retention there's this issue of settlement needs for international. Do we who is who who can provide these services to international students? Is it universities? Is it settlement agencies? Employers? There's like a, a discussion now happening with this uh, uh, provincially, federally. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on this. Uh, we know also, well, maybe I, this is on the policy front, maybe I'll jump this, but there's been a lot of changes. But when we think, everything started from this, I, when I, I, there's this notion that we can link uh, foreign students with immigration. Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was not as clear. I think we would say, we have, you're a foreign student or you're an immigrant, and if you want to be an immigrant, you need to leave the country and go through the system but not staying in the country. So there was really this distinction between f foreign students and uh, potential immigrant. But it, 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 it changes uh, and I think this why because we tend to frame foreign students in, in a certain way. So we see them as a because of low birth rates of aging population, we see students as a response. They are, they're young, they can, so we hear that, we can read that in reports. Uh, we know that that place too, I mean it's human capital, we see it as a, 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 I mean an important part of innovation in the knowledge economy, that plays. I think this argument is very important in Canada, it played a lot in the policies, uh, credentials because of of de-skilling of economic immigrants and large studies showing that a few years ago. We, 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 we know that recognition of qualification is, is a challenge, it's still a challenge. So looking at international students and saying well with a, a Canadian degree and work and a Canadian work experience it's a way of of bypassing this problem of recognition of qualification. So that played a lot. We know also that we see students, and in, in my study we, 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 we see this a lot in smaller campuses, in smaller communities. We tend to frame students as an added value, a cultural value. Uh, in Moncton they were saying, uh, well it's nice to have international students so our, our local students can discover the world in their classroom. Uh, the Acadian students who are of not maybe, I mean who are, it's a very homogeneous population, uh, well, close to 80% I think of the student population in Moncton is Acadian and the rest is international. You don't have a lot in between. And so it was like, and the university played on this and we hear that I mean, not only in Moncton, but I think it's an added, we see it as an, a, an international flavor to the region, to the community, 
and uh, you'll you'll see. But there's also a big reason tuition fees uh, that plays a lot. Uh, universities are recruiting because uh, students can is I mean it's uh, differential fees uh, and. Uh, it plays a lot also in smaller regions or communities where you have a, a decline of, of, of uh, I mean, we know that uh, low birth rates, uh, less uh, students from the community, so universities will see international students maybe as, uh, as a way of uh, getting money in. Okay. Uh, this is just a, an illustration where you see over the years, that was in Moncton, it's a small department where I was, but I think it, it plays, it's interesting because we see it in, in, in other universities. When I did the study on the francophone small universities, that played a lot. We saw something happening in 2008, 2009, and then when I think of last year in my department, it was 50-50. We had 50% international students in a poly science department. So not a business school, not, not engineer, where we think it would be that those uh, units where you would have more international students, but social science, we had, uh, we had a distribution that really changed in a few years. So is it recruitment? Is it the way the universities are recruiting more? Is it uh, is it policies? There's a few factors that could explain this, but uh, that's where we are today, in a way. And in these universities, it changes a, a lot of things. I mean, it changes the, the classroom, but then it changes the whole service, uh, the, the service, the, the service structure, uh, what happens after, all these issues. Recruitment, for example, this is a, an example I will give you. My university, maybe to explain why you have 50%. Is my university, my former university, was quite innovative in recruitment. Uh, they were uh, they were using actually former students to be recruiters, former students from the country uh, of origin. So, for example, Morocco, uh, they would have a former Moroccan student uh, who was in Moncton, and they were saying, "Well, now you go back to Morocco." and go recruit students. And they said it was a system that by using former students, there's a proximity, it's a, it's a, these, these recruiters can talk to the young students in, in schools in the countries of origin and tell them, well, Moncton has this to offer and you know, there's a sale pitch again. But they were paid by the number of students they were recruiting, so that was a bit, uh, <laughs> A bit touchy, but so they were called recruteurs au début, and that didn't play well, so they called them ambassador after, yeah. just it looks better, but still, they were recruiting students, and they were paid $1,500 per student recruited. If the student was staying six months, paying his fees, so uh, it made me realize that universities can use different systems. I don't know how. The, the classic model would be a consultant going in a few countries, going in, into embassy to maybe talk to certain uh, schools. Uh, but this system was almost going straight to the families. So these students, these recruiters were very, uh, they were doing uh, maybe good work, but they were also interested by, by uh, getting paid. And uh, it, it, you know, it, it was a, a strain. Maybe that explains the high number of, uh, of uh, students in, in Moncton, but it, it, it's one model. And, and we realized there were plenty of models. Now, ethically, <laughs> it's a question, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip. When we think, sorry? She no, says don't skip. She's working on student migration. She wants you to ah. skip. <laughs> no, but I. You can skip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I talked about I talked about recruitment. I think the other big piece now is transition. Uh, uh, I know integration is a big piece, and you could look at we looked at the at it from all perspective from 
people welcome you, welcome you at the airport, which is something university will do. I mean, we can go very micro and, and see how you know, we integrate uh, on campuses and what type of services. But I think the whole issue now is transition also. And uh, that's where you know, on the, we see some, some changes in Canada where we see students making their transition through these new uh, pathways, which is, uh, you know them, CEC and, and the PNP, the Provincial Nominee Program. So w there, is a, there is this trend of, of uh, students more uh, staying now, or uh, w intention of staying into Canada is, is, is something that we see. And that, that came out in the study where these type of questions, they come up also when students arrive in a university. They will ask these type of questions where maybe five, ten years ago, I mean, the question of, of work permit, of, uh, of uh, transition to permanent residence was not, as, was not something that universities would see. But that's where there is a, when I say who gives that type of information, is it on campus, is it university, or is it settlement, uh, other actors who can give that type of information. Transition, we know there's some factors and this came up from uh, 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 the work we just did, uh, the review, uh, the knowledge synthesis on, on the contribution of international students to, to Canada and we know that in the literature you see a, more and more work on the transition element and uh, there's some determinants uh, why, I mean, reason that the transition can be successful, but there's also some barriers still to, to look at. And, and that's something we, we, I heard a lot also doing interviews with a settlement where I talked about, so are you providing services to international students? What type of services? What would be important? And, you know, these two actually were were the most important in this one here, you know, that came up, who can provide these services. Uh, bon, un petit peu, I'm just jumping a bit, yeah. but uh, when I did this film also on, on international students, I just wanted to, to bring you maybe an element where I think research needs to be innovative or, I mean, sometimes you have to think beyond. The I did this film and I thought the film was a, a project it was, it was research, but it was also uh, knowledge dissemination. It was knowledge transfer. And during the film on, uh, uh, I, I, we, it was a film on, on actually students working in call centers. So the reality of, of international students in, in the city of Moncton was also that the opportunity is not, you know, you find, you get a degree uh, in administration or and you end up working in a call center. Now, I mean, th maybe I would need more research on this to make sure, but there was the sense of talking to students and knowing that the economy of, of Moncton, I don't know how it's here, but Moncton is a city that changed in the 80s from a CN city, a blue collar city. We had these huge, uh, I mean, it was Canadian, it was railway city and it, it changed to you could call it uh, new economy or services or high tech, but mostly call centers. Why? Could someone maybe say, you have an idea why Moncton would be the mecca of the call centers? It's bilingual. Because it's bilingual. Because they would say, hey, we're a bilingual city. We're the o <laughs> I think we're the only official bilingual city. Not even Ottawa, but uh, uh, so it played a lot in bringing big companies to Moncton, so, you know, Banque Nationale, uh, you know, big uh, multinational uh, service. And uh, more and more we saw also that for students it was a, an opportunity to, to work in the call centers. Some call centers even recruit on campus, they go to, to the university, they, they provide transportation for students. But anyway, the, the whole issue was there was that if you, is it really like one of my character in the film said after four years of paying close to $80,000 I end up in a call center? Is it really what I expected from this? And 
the film really showed this and I just put this because uh, during the film also we met these two students and I they were uh, working in call centers but they were also rappers that's what they were saying but so they wrote they wrote me a song so I said w write me a song about the call centers I said and when when you do if when you do these type of project uh, you need sometimes to you need to react pretty fast and you meet people uh, in film you meet sometimes people or you meet a face and you think well I can ask him let's ask him something and we'll see where it goes and I said well why don't you write a song and they wrote a song that really I illustrates very well the whole project uh, uh, and uh, I was quite happy with this because they were actually describing the reality of of the call center environment and the the despair maybe of these students who who travel so far from Mali or Gabon and uh, you know that's for them maybe it was a uh, it was not what they were expected and the film also when I say research dissemination the film helped also <coughs> with uh, you know talking about this issue in the community so we had a lot of you know discussion uh, we had some discussion with a, a settlement group, uh, a francophone settlement group, uh, who organized these uh, cinq cassettes where we could discuss uh, uh, issues. And this one was about work, work for everyone. And the film was shown, employers came. So you see that's another example maybe of, of how the research can help the, the community. So it's an ongoing project, I would say, international students. Uh, uh, I think it's a very important one. Finally, temporary foreign workers. Just a few slides. Uh, in Atlantic Canada, what we're seeing also is a rise of, of temporary foreign workers, like you saw before, but every province has it. Uh, and that, came, that led us, a group of, of uh, colleagues at, in my former university, to look at this. And we were interested in knowing that this is what we, we realize, we have this logic of pathways to permanent residence for skilled workers, but when we think of vulnerable migrants, we tend to be sometimes in a different uh, environment where we have less, uh, less possibilities to transition to permanent residence. And that really is something that, I mean, we saw in the literature uh, so the, f the, f the notion of temporariness, where you have uh, categories of migrants who, would, who will stay in this uh, condition. So we were interested by these questions. Uh, and really looking at this from a perspective of rural, rural communities, okay? So we're looking at small communities, <coughs> 2,000 less than 2,000 and one in especially. Uh, so really how do we, how can we think integration in a small, small community where you, where you, and especially if you're a temporary foreign worker, uh, uh, is it even useful to think about it? But we had discussion with uh, people, employers, but also people who work at the municipality in these little, little, and they were concerned. They were talking about, well, we have more and more temporary foreign workers, and we know they're in the community, but uh, uh, we don't really know what to do. <laughs> Is it the employer only who deals with that and we do nothing? Or do we, do we, can we, can we do some awareness program? Or can, so maybe that's really the, my interest in this project is to also work with different stakeholders and see how maybe there, there can, things can be done in, 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 in the case of what I'm going to present now just to rapidly. Uh, oh, this one was in French, huh? a little exercise at the end. But, uh, uh, but we want to really to look at these profiles of, and categories of migrants in the Atlantic, but really we want to, like I said, look at rural region, Look, it's the same type of research I did on international students, but maybe looking at a, another population, but looking also at uh, where are they situated, uh, these migrants, these temporary foreign workers, uh, and, and try to work with uh, different uh, actors in, in the community. 
we, ch we made the decision to work on a small city close to Moncton, New Brunswick, which is Cap Pelé, uh, lobster place. Uh, it's actually f fish plants, uh, fish plants hiring Mexicans and mostly Filipinos, people from the Philippines. And uh, a city, like I said, who has uh, just over 2,000. Uh, a lot of the youth in this city goes to Alberta. <laughs> they don't stay around, they don't work in the fish plant. So the, f the two main <coughs> companies uh, who are hiring more than hiring a, a, a large number of employees need some, some people. So they're, they're going through the, the TFW uh, system to get uh, foreign workers uh, in, in, in the region. So that's a, also a reality of Atlantic Canada. So you can have, you, you have the Koreans, you have the international students, but you have now more and more, you have also Filipinos, Guatemala, Mexico, and in that little community, it's, it's interesting, it's a francophone community. So that's another clash. And you had people in the community naively saying, well, why don't we recruit TFW in IT? And like they said, well, we don't, it doesn't work. Uh, there's no, it's easier. The employer has a way of recruiting through maybe some channels that he knows. And he's not going to think linguistic uh, uh, reality of the little village. So that brings a, a new reality to these small community, francophone community, where you have in this community, we, we, we ask the question to the employers, and it's more than 600 temporary foreign workers. So it's 600 temporary foreign workers working, but also they go to Tim Horton, or they go to, they, they need food, they, they walk, they bike. Uh, they're around, but uh, are they really around? Like the, the whole issue of are they, 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 they work in, the, in these little villages, but I think the, there's a question of integration also when we think of TFW and it's something that is becoming an issue in rural uh, regions in, in, the re in the Atlantic Canada. Okay, uh, just uh, you see we want to look at this also from different, from a, that's what I like about this project. It's, we have people in sociology, we have social work, sociolinguistic, political science, and we want to look at it from different angle. We don't want to look at only one perspective. We have, we, we think it's interesting to look at it from, from and, and address issues, discrimination, racism, gender issues, language. Uh, we, we think it's, it plays out in, 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 we know there's a lot of uh, immigrants from Jamaica also, mostly women who, who come to work. And uh, it's a very interesting case, I find, when I go back to my little picture here, because I just, Capelé before, we realized, just going back a bit, we had workers coming from Newfoundland who would come to Capelé in New Brunswick and work. So we had workers already coming from, a, from another part of the country, but it changed. The people in Newfoundland, I mean, mostly women also, they, it, it stopped. Uh, maybe is it because we have the Alberta factor too, and it changed. So the employers were in need of of new sources of, of workers and so they looked, I mean with the, the reforms in the TFW and the pilot project where they were able to, to go in and ask for, for, for workers, uh, it changed. So we see it uh, in little communities across the Atlantic, mostly f fish plants, but agriculture in Ontario, uh, I mean that's uh, very common. Okay, so like I say, we I think in the Atlantic region there is a there is we need to be pay, we need to pay attention to urban rural. I think it's very interesting when we we think immigration because there's this I mean it's small numbers. I mean we're not talking big numbers, but we're talking uh, immigration to urban uh, setting. But also we see some immigration or some migration in rural regions. So I think it's a different reality. Uh, like I said, the mismatch is something we see in the region. Uh, 
if I think of maybe uh, international students, there's a, this notion also, it's, it's maybe, it, it's a response to the problem of, of credential, but then even if we have uh, international students tr making the transition, there's also the issue of de-skilling that can, that can still happen. It's not, it's not, it can happen also. So it, uh, I think we, in, the, in, in this m economic model of immigration in Canada, you, you, you bring the, the ex how do you say, the expectation higher for some immigrants uh, who come with uh, uh, some expectation because they have the talent and we talk a lot about the skills and the talent and then you see people hitting the wall. And I don't know if students can be a, a, a case, but I think Korean immigrants can be, we can see that. Uh, European migrants, French immigrants in New Brunswick, we saw that too. That's another case I'm interested in. F immigrants from France, they're very, we love them. Huh? They're from <laughs> France and we think they're gonna integrate very well, but they have also problem. They, they see uh, some, uh, there's a, but disconnected with the community uh, uh, and they don't think like a minority. I heard that from French immigrants saying, <laughs> I don't care about uh, sending my, my kid to the French school. I want, I'm in Canada and I want to send my kid to the English school. And that creates a big, uh, you know, you'll see the, the minority will say, oh, we, you can't do that. Anyway, I'm jumping. Finally, uh, so maybe these are very general comments, but uh, I think it, when we think immigration in the region also, uh, we, need, we see a lot of changes in, 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 the, in the Atlantic. Uh, I think one actor, a little spelling error, one actor that's still missing is municipalities. Like I said, they tend to be uh, passive. They're, they're not proactive, uh, but there's a, we can, I see some other provinces where we have some you know, diversity, policy, strategies in Quebec, Ontario, the LIP model that, I mean, is a, a way of getting more actors uh, in, in immigration. So collaboration is a key, maybe mainstreaming. Sometimes I think mainstreaming services to immigrants can be a way also of getting uh, people in a community more involved in, 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 in thinking about and, and understanding the, the needs of immigrants. And finally, employers in, in the Atlantic, but that's also a very general comment, I think. <laughs> it can be said even in big cities, but uh, in the region, we know small and medium-sized businesses tend to still maybe to be cautious when we, we say to, to employers, well, you need to be at the table and you need to be part of, 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 of efforts in immigration. Donc, je vais m'arrêter là. Merci. Thank you. Thank you.